This first slide is actually about my research. So my lab does a lot of research on plants and insects, and specifically on corn and aphids feeding on corn. That's not what I'm going to be talking about today, though. I'd like to talk about uh, plant genetic engineering more generally, um, specifically how plants get genetically engineered if we're doing that, and also what's out there in the field right now, and a little bit about the future prospects, potential concerns of plant genetic engineering, what we need to look out for in the, in the long run. So how many of you have eaten genetically engineered food today, you think? We all should be raising our hand. So unless you, you know, survive entirely on homegrown vegetables, it's essentially impossible to avoid genetically engineered foods in the US. Um, if you look at the back of any sort of package, uh, you see an ingredient list, and you know immediately that you're probably eating genetically engineered food. So first off, anything that says corn or soy or canola or cotton, cottonseed oil on it, is almost certainly genetically engineered. So um, the other thing is, though, there are a lot of sort of hidden genetic engineering ingredients. That's what I've marked here with these other areas. So a lot of um, additives that we have in our food products, vitamins in particular, uh, dextrose, um, basically sugar, are either made from genetically engineered plants or are made in cell culture or yeast culture, and those are almost certainly then genetically engineered microorganisms. Um, if anybody wants these, I see you guys taking notes, if anybody wants these slides, I'm happy to, to send them out. I'll give them to Delaney and she can send them to you if you're interested in. So basically any sort of packaged food that you're, you're looking at is going to have some sort of genetically engineered um, substances in there, either directly from plants or from microorganisms or you know, things that are from processed plants. Um, so what is genetic engineering? How would you define that? What, what, what do you... What is plant genetic engineering? Any ideas? Yeah. Yeah. Any other ideas? That sounds pretty good. So the way I've defined it here is um, basically changing a plant in some way that we can't do by traditional breeding. So anything that was done before, let's say, 1985 or so, is not genetic engineering, and then putting in genes that we couldn't do with classic breeding would be genetic engineering. Why would you want to genetically engineer a plant? Any ideas? Yeah? Because you want to do something that can't be accomplished with traditional breeding. Exactly, yeah, but what would you want to accomplish? Uh, yeah? Larger yields. Larger yields, right? Disease resistance. Disease resistance. Pest resistance. Interest, nutritional content. The other big one is herbicide resistance. I'll be talking about that a bit more. And yeah, so we talked about some of these things already. So that the, the real driver is yield is money. And if you can get more yield for less input, then as a farmer, you'll probably want to plant those seeds. And then the traits that many of you mentioned here, you know, weed resistance, pest resistance, pesticide resistance, herbicide resistance, and then more quality traits, which have been secondary. Uh, before talking about what is genetic engineering, I want to talk about what's not genetic engineering and what's been accomplished with traditional plant breeding. So here's an example of, of corn and its wild ancestor, Teosinte. On the right are corn plants. On the left is Teosinte. So you can see the plant architecture is very different. Corn has a tassel at the top, an ear here. Teosinte has a tassel and an ear at the top at the same place. Teosinte is very branched, corn is not. Teosinte has single rows of seeds that you have to crack open with a nutcracker, basically. And sweet corn, you obviously have multiple rows of seeds, and um, you can eat them directly. So Native Americans, over a, you know, a few thousand years, with just traditional selection, managed to turn teosinte into corn without doing any sort of genetic engineering. Um, Europeans obviously also domesticated crops. Here's an example of European breeding. This is wild cabbage on the, in its natural habitat on the cliffs of Dover. It's just a, a weedy little crucifer, and it's been bred into all of these things, from ranging from, you know, from cauliflower to kohlrabi to cabbage, so different colors, different leaf shapes, all just based on, on natural selection. Basically looking, somebody you know, at some point you know, found a cabbage that was red instead of green and said, you know, this is sort of cool, Let, let's 
breed that, or found a cabbage with a thick stem and said, you know, this is, tastes sort of good, let's breed some cabbage with thick stems. Um, so these are all natural mutations from cosmic rays or whatever, and you were finding those by random chance and then selecting the ones that you like. So the next obvious step then is, you know, rather than waiting for that cosmic ray to make the mutation, why not just induce mutations? And there's various ways you can induce mutations in plants. You can do chemical mutagenesis or you can do radiation. Um, one example here is the, what they call gamma field in Japan. They have a, a radiation source here in the middle of the field that they can raise up and then plants here in concentric circles around there. They can irradiate them. Um, the whole thing is set into the ground so they're not irradiating their neighbors. And then a lot of crop plants have actually been produced by radiation breeding or, or, or selected mutagenesis. Um, probably the one you'd be most likely to encounter is, is hard pasta weed, Italian durum weed, is a product of uh, a selected mutation by, by what they call radiation breeding. So that's also one way to sort of accelerate the breeding process and get, look for the kind of mutations you want, is just to make more of them and so you don't have to wait as long to get the mutation that you want. This can be due in a, a very um, targeted manner. So there's a company, KeyGene in the Netherlands, for instance, they're making targeted mutagenesis by random mutations. They're chemically mutagenizing plants and then screening tens of thousands of plants to find that exact point mutation that they're looking for. The other thing, obviously, you can do is you can breed wild relatives. That's illustrated here. So we're breeding in you know, genes from wild relatives of tomato and getting you know, a variety of traits. And then you can select for, for traits that you want that are not in the current breeding programs. The problem with this sort of thing is if you're crossing wild relatives, let's say it's Salam Chimelewski to Salam Esculentum, you can cross in genes, but you get linkage drag of genes that might, you might not want. Like if you're selecting for disease resistance, maybe small green fruit genes are next to the disease resistance genes, and it takes you a while to get rid of them. And sometimes it's just impossible to get rid of linked genes because there's not enough you know, DNA similarity to get the right kind of crossovers. And so for instance, here's an example of uh, wheat breeding where they bred in some fungal resistance genes from rye into wheat, and they're basically bringing in one large segment of the, the rye genome into the wheat genome, but then getting resistance to a variety of fungal pathogens. Um, in this case, they managed to breed to the point that they have a, you know, a usable wheat, um, but they also brought in 2,500 genes from rye. So this is you know, breeding. It's a, a moderately exact science, but it's difficult to get you know, just one gene in by breeding from a wild relative. And you're also then limited by genes that you can bring in from crop plants that you can cross to each other. So with some effort, you can cross wheat and rye, but you're never going to cross tomato and wheat to bring in a tomato gene into wheat. And so that's where, where um, genetic engineering comes in, is we can you know, take single genes, put them in a plant, and then have a, a single uh, transgenic event. So how do we get genes into plants? There's really two methods that are used on a, a commercial scale. Uh, one is what's called the gene gun. It's illustrated here. It was invented here at Cornell University and initially actually literally was a gun. So they coated um, small gold particles with DNA, put them in a shotgun shell and blasted them at plant leaves. And enough of them you know, would hit the nucleus and the DNA would integrate into the chromosomal DNA of the plant. Uh, nowadays, you don't do that with a shotgun shell anymore. You do it with high pressure helium with a rupture disc here another disc here with gold particles with the DNA. This ruptures from the helium pressure, it blasts against here, and the DNA particles get blasted onto your leaf. And then you get some transformed plant cells, and you, from these individual cells, you can regenerate plants then, grow them in tissue culture, and then eventually move them to the field. So this is fairly established technology, and a lot of transgenic plants that are out there in the field right now were made with this uh, gene gun uh, transformation system. This is nice because no plant pathogens, no bacteria are involved. It's just DNA going into plant DNA. Um, easier and more commonly used, however, is, is agrobacterium-mediated transformation. That's illustrated here in the, the next slide. Um, agrobacterium is a, a natural bacterium that's found out in nature. Um, what it does, it has a, a plasmid um, called the TI plasmid. And on this plasmid, there is a segment of DNA called the tDNA, 
which has repeated sequences at the end and is then transferred by the agrobacterium into the plant cell, goes into the nucleus, and integrates in the plant cell in the nucleus of the plant. What you can do then, you can put any gene that you want to here into the agrobacterium. It gets integrated into the nucleus, and you have um, a transgenic plant. But you always then also have you know, parts of the agrobacterium. And since agrobacterium is a plant pathogen, this subjects you to a whole other level of regulation because you, now you have a plant with DNA from a plant pathogen integrated, and the USDA, in its regulatory purposes, treats that differently than plants that were made with a, a gene gun. Um, just aside here, here's what agrobacterium naturally does. On the natural tDNA plasmid, there's genes that um, cause this tumor formation on the plant uh, called a crown gall tumor. This tumor is not actually where the bacteria are living, but in the tumor, the, the bacteria have turned on the synthesis of small molecules that serve as nutrients for the bacteria that are now living in the phloem elsewhere in the plant. And so it's basically co-opting the plant metabolism to make this tumor, to make nutrients um, that the bacteria are able to grow on. But we've then co-opted this to, to make the genetically engineered plants. So this is how most genetically engineered plants that are out there in the field right now have been made. And um, this is used in research a lot. A lot of you in your labs that where you're working now will be using agrobacterium mediated transformation or plants that were made with agrobacterium for your research. Um, however, it's also used um, since 1986 to make commercially you know, sold genetically engineered plants. The first uh, genetically engineered plant in 1986 was what was called the Flavor Saver Tomato. They had made a tomato that uh, they thought would have a longer shelf life. It has an enzyme that prevents uh, degradation of the plant cell walls. So as the tomato ripens, the cell walls degrade, it becomes mushy, and then the shelf life decreases. And so they blocked that enzyme and they called it the Flavor Saver Tomato because it was supposed to be uh, longer on the shelf. That was in 1986, and that sort of set off the revolution of genetically engineered plants. Uh, here is just um, uh, worldwide hectares of genetically engineered plants. It's been going up steadily since 1986, maybe a little bit of a, a plateau here, but likely to, to increase in, in the coming years. It's on the order of around 10% of all the, the world's acreage or hectares of uh, crop plants right now are, are genetically engineered. So where is that in the, the world? There's um, Right now, 26 countries where genetically engineered crops are grown legally. Uh, the legally has to be emphasized here. There's probably a, a number of other countries where farmers have acquired seeds and are, are planting them because they work well, but the regulations aren't as, as good as they, they might be. So this is a little bit deceptive because the vast majority of the acreage is not in you know, tw 26 different countries. It's really in only five countries. So 91% of all the genetically engineered crops are grown in uh, five countries around the world. And among those, the US is here by far the, the largest uh, uh, user of genetically engineered crop plants. So I'd like to um, talk a little bit about what we have growing in the United States, what we have genetically engineered, and you know, how those are made, what, what, what they're good for. So the, the main genetically engineered crops that we have are soybean, corn, cotton, canola, sugar beet, and alfalfa in terms of acreage. And for most of these, the vast majority of these crop plants are, are genetically engineered. So corn and soybean, you know, are over 90%, cotton and canola, much smaller acreage, but also the vast majority genetically engineered. Sugar beets and alfalfa are much smaller acreage. Um, and alfalfa you know, is just, just starting out. It's the, the most recent approval of the genetically engineered plants and therefore still has the smallest total acreage that's genetically engineered right now. Uh, what this means though, if you're eating anything with these top five plants in here, um, you're probably gonna be eating genetically engineered food unless you're paying extra specifically to get food that's um, organic and, uh, yeah. Does the United States also produce the majority of the GMO crops? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, in terms of acreage, we have the majority and we have the highest productivity in most, in most cases also. What about individual uh, strains? Yeah, all strains? yeah, also, yeah. And we're also the number one exporter of things like soybean and corn. And so it's, you know, that um, just 
the genetic engineering basically the started here in the US and the regulation has been, let's say, less restrictive than in Europe, for instance, and other parts of the world. And so it's probably, you know, in part because it's US companies selling genetically engineered seeds, they're lobbying Congress, and in turn, the, the regulations are easier here in the US. So that's actually what I wanted to talk next about is, is regulation. And it's, it's really a two-step process. There's one step where you, let's say, you make a better cucumber and you want to just test it out in the field. You need a, a permit to plant it outside. If you then decide it really is a better cucumber and you want to commercialize it, then it's a whole other level of regulation to prove that it's safe for human consumption. Um, getting permits to pr plant genetically engineered plants out in the field is actually quite simple. Um, there's an Animal Plant Health Inspection Service section of the USDA where you can go in and apply for permits. You need permits for different kinds of things, for moving any sort of um, plant pathogen across state lines. You go to the APHIS website to get a permit to um, move any sort of genetically engineered plants. You have to get a permit to import plants, genetically engineered or not, into the United States. You go to the APHIS website to get a permit. And then also you need an APHIS permit to plant things in the field. This is actually my own APHIS uh, website or login, and so there's you know, BRS permits here that I've gotten that stands for Biotechnology Regulatory Services for working with genetically engineered plants, and we've also gotten some permits for, for planting in things in the field, and it's very straightforward. You apply, you check off some boxes, and a month or two later you get a permit, and you can plant your things in the field. And so this is done literally thousands of times every year by both scientists and academic labs, and probably even more so by companies. And pretty much every state in the country every year has things that are genetically engineered that are planted outside for research or testing or developmental purposes. Um, here's a map from 2015. It doesn't really matter which year I'm showing. But basically, every state, pretty much every state in the country has applications for planting GMO crops outside every single year. On yep. The, the Hawaii, <laughs> why, why are the, yeah, so Hawaii is a unique case because all the corn seed companies plant corn in the Midwest in the summer, and then they have a winter nursery in Hawaii. And so they apply for permits both here, you know, in the Midwest, you see there's big numbers here for corn, and then in Hawaii they have their winter nurseries, and they need a, a separate permit for planting in Hawaii. So this, the permits are on the, the individual state level. No, then, yeah, w w once it's deregulated, I'll talk about that later, but once they're deregulated, you know, once they're c considered safe for human consumption, then they're, you can plant them anywhere you want to. Um, this is a, a different level. This is just for research and testing. Like if I'm working on corn in my lab and want to make a mutation with genetic engineering, and I want to test it in the field in Aurora, then I have to get a permit, and you know, I would you know, add one to this number here if I applied for a permit. All this is public information. You can go to the USDA website and just download a massive spreadsheet with all these data. This is just somebody took the time to actually put numbers by state. Um, the other interesting way to look at this is what plants do people apply for for planting in the field as genetically engineered. And it's um, pretty much anything that you could ever imagine genetic engineering in terms of plants has been planted in the outside in the US as a genetically engineered plant. Corn is somewhere way off the scale there. I don't even know how many thousands. Um, so yeah, so it's relatively easy. It's done a lot, and it's um, fairly lightly regulated. So you basically, you apply for this permit, and you check off the boxes saying that, you know, I'm going to you know, plant this outside. I'm going to remove everything at the end of the year. I'm going to make sure that no pollen spreads to other plants, and that the field is as good as new at the end of the summer. So you had a question back there? That, that's just field testing, right? So, yeah, so in the, at this point, all you need is approval from the USDA. Um, however, if you do your field testing and you say you have a really good crop now and you want to start selling it for human consumption, then it gets really complicated. Because um, then you're not dealing with just the USDA. You're also dealing with two other government agencies, the, the USDA, the FDA, and the EPA altogether. And they have different different functions in what they're trying to protect. 
So the, the USDA is really only interested in agriculture. They're saying, you know, is this going to hurt or help US agriculture? FDA is protecting human health, Food and Drug Administration. And you know, if we put this gene in the plant, is it going to hurt people that are eating the crop? And then the EPA is interested in protecting the environment. If you make this transgenic crop, is it going to become a super weed? Is it going to cross with weeds in the environment and make super weeds by moving your gene in by genetic crosses into other plants? And so that gets uh, pretty expensive, a lot of tests involved. and Really, they're looking at overall sort of food and, and feed safety. Um, as I mentioned, you know, is it safer in the environment? Is it safe for people? Is it safe for, for US agriculture? Um, involves several years of testing, probably millions of dollars for any given crop that you want to genetically engineer and get it approved for human consumption. There's animal tests involved. There's human tests involved. There's tests involved. You, know, you have to show exactly how you engineered the plant, where your gene is integrated, is there only one gene in integrated? Is the plant that you've produced substantially the same as what you had before, except for the gene that you integrated? So it's a, lo a long and involved process. Um, it's not only you know, expensive, but also time consuming. And the current estimate is that if you're a company you know, working on trying to make a genetically engineered crop, you know, from when you discover your gene to transform it, to screen it, to um, development, uh, evaluating it on regulatory basis, it's probably seven to 10 years from actually finding a gene to getting it approved to plant out in the field for, for human consumption. So what that means then is that there are relatively few plants that have been deregulated, that are approved for planting in the field for humans to actually eat. Um, so there's thousands of you know, things planted every year outside just for trials but things that are actually approved for deregulation that are saying this is safe, you can plant it, you can sell it at you know, Wegmans is relatively few. And again, a, a relatively small number of crop plants involved. Again, corn, cotton, soybean, you know, uh, really at the top of the list now. And all of these have been approved, but what's actually being sold is much less than that. There's probably a dozen or so things that you would buy at the supermarket on a regular basis that are genetically engineered that have been you know, on, on this list in some form. So I wanted to talk next about you know, what actually is it that we're eating here? What, what has been deregulated for human consumption? Again, looking at the, the top crop plants here, the ones that are largely 90% you know, or more genetically engineered right now, there's really a fairly small number of you know, broad classifications of traits that are being engineered right now. They're all things that are geared towards farmers. So things that allow the farmer to plant the corn more cheaply or um, have fewer inputs and basically make more money off, off the corn crop. So they're not things that would make the corn better for you to eat. No, not, nothing that you would pay more for when you buy the corn or cotton or soybeans. And really two traits here. The big one here is herbicide resistance. And what that means is, is that they make crops that are herbicide resistant. The farmer can plant the crop in the field. Uh, the plants are about this high. The, he sprays the herbicide and all the weeds are dead. And then he has to not deal with competing weeds. He doesn't have to hoe the field or um, try to get re rid of the weeds in other ways. And it's a fairly efficient way to far for farmers to get rid of weeds. Um, so what, what are the targets of these herbicides? And Amino acid biosynthesis is actually a big target for herbicides because when you're developing an herbicide, one thing that you have to show is that your herbicide will kill plants but not kill people. And this is a list of essential and non-essential amino acids. Essential amino acids means that they're amino acids that animals can't make. And non-essential amino acids means that we have biosynthetic enzymes for these pathways. And so these are now attractive targets for herbicides because if you have an herbicide that targets an, an essential amino acid biosynthesis pathway, that means you have an herbicide that's targeting an enzyme that's only found in plants and microorganisms but is not found in animals. And so many of the most abundant herbicides that are out there right now are, are targeting essential amino acid biosynthesis. So several herbicides sold by different companies here are targeting branch chain amino acid biosynthesis. Um, another class of herbicides, Roundup, which I'll be talking about in a little bit more detail, 
targets um, branch chain, sorry, not branch, uh, targets aromatic amino acid biosynthesis. And then here, BASTA, which is another commonly sold herbicide, is targeting um, glutamine, glutamate biosynthesis, but again, targeting enzymes that wouldn't be found in, an, in animals in the initial biosynthesis of these amino acids. So you have now herbicides that are targeting these plant uh, enzymes, and you want to make a plant that's resistant to these herbicides. And there's two general ways th th that that's been done. One is you can um, make so-called target site resistance, and that what are en whatever enzyme this herbicide is targeting, you know, it's targeting a specific conformation on the surface of the enzyme, you can change that so the herbicide doesn't bind anymore, and then the plant is herbicide resistant. And the other way is, is to um, make an enzyme that degrades your herbicide. So in the case of the, these herbicides here that are in, inhibiting branch chain amino acid biosynthesis, that's all a target site resistance. This here is also target site resistance. And the BASTA resistance is an enzyme that degrades the, the BASTA enzyme, that degrades the, the BASTA herbicide. And um, what's noteworthy then is how easy is it to develop resistance to these herbicides. So these herbicides here that are targeting branched chain amino acids, it turns out that that enzyme that's being targeted, a single base pair change will make those plants herbicide resistant. So you get resistance developing very rapidly here. For Roundup, it turns out you need several mutations in the plant gene to make it resistant. So you don't develop herbicide resistance as quickly. Um, BASTA is sort of an intermediate case. So there is some target side resistance in plants. And so you will also de development of resistance of weeds to BASTA. I'm going to talk a little bit more in detail about Roundup now, since that's the, the number one herbicide in the world right now. It's used on you know, many millions of acres, is highly effective, and sold by the Monsanto company, which has in turn also now developed a gene that provides resistance to Roundup. So Roundup acts by inhibiting an enzyme called enopyruvate shikimate phosphate synthase, which is an intermediate in the synthesis of these amino acids. So if you spray the plants with Roundup, this enzyme is inhibited. The plants can't make these amino acids anymore, and then the plant dies. So the, the key discovery then, or the key innovation was, is they looked for bacterial enzymes that are insensitive to Roundup. They found one in a um, strain of agrobacterium that is resistant to Roundup. They moved this gene into the plant, and now the corn or soybeans that Monsanto is producing are resistant to Roundup because they can continue to make these amino acids, whereas the weeds that don't have this transgene um, are resistant to the are, are, are sensitive to the herbicide. So Roundup has been sold for quite a while. This um, Roundup ready or Roundup resistant plants have been sold l less, uh, lesser amount of time, but were first again sold in 1996, very shortly after the flavor saver tomato and really took off quite rapidly. This is the first you know, eight to 10 years of uh, glyphosate resistant Roundup ready plants. And the net effect has been that we have here increased in area of glyphosate resistant plants. You know, as farmers are adopting these, there's more and more acreage of these so-called Roundup ready plants. The net effect, however, has been that herbicide resistance or herbicide use has declined over that amount of time, simply because rather than spraying a number of different herbicides on their crop plants over the course of the growing season, farmers are now planting these glyphosate resistant plants and are only spraying once. And in instead of buying lots of different herbicides, they're only having to buy Roundup. And then the total use of herbicides decreased over time. The other effect has been um, costs for farmers. The cost that, you know, as herbicide use has decreased, the cost that the farmers are spending on agricultural chemicals declined over the same amount of time, but the cost of seeds has increased. And that, my pointer is sort of dying here, but um, it roughly equals out. So their cost of in seeds has increased. The farmers have to, don't have to, but are buying seeds from Monsanto and other companies that are herbicide resistant. They're spending more on seeds. They're spending more on chemical, less on chemicals, but that net input is sort of equal. So why are the farmers all buying these Roundup Ready seeds then? Any? Yeah, 
but there are companies that don't sell Roundup Ready seeds. So why, why are all the farmers buying the Roundup Ready seeds even though they cost more? And why are they buying them? And they're, they're saving some money on chemicals, but you know, it's not a, not a big savings here. Why would, they, why would any farmer want to buy Roundup Ready seeds then? It's, it's easier. That's the, the big savings come not in buying the seeds and the chemicals, but in how much time the farmer spends in the field. Um, basically, it's expensive to run a tractor through a field. Every time you spray your field, you're, you're spending a gallon of diesel fuel per acre. If you have you know, thousands of, of acres of cornfield, you're spending a lot of money spraying your field. Also, a lot of time. You know, every time you run through the field, you spend days um, uh, spraying your field. And here's some cost analysis that's been done on soybeans. So this farmer here on the left uh, has planted Roundup Ready soybeans. He hasn't even bothered plowing the field. You can see the corn stubble from the previous year. Normally, if you weren't spraying them, you would plow your field to put the weed seeds underground before you plant your soybeans. He hasn't done that. He's just planted the soybeans, sprayed Roundup, and there are no, feeds, feels, no weeds here. And the soybean field on the right there is mature. It doesn't have any weeds. And so their calculation is the farmer has about 23% lower work involved in raising the soybeans. Um, savings of you know, fuel is about $45 per hectare. The other big savings is that there's lower weed content in the soybean seeds. So when you harvest these soybeans, there are fewer weed seeds in there. You can sell them for more money at the grain elevator if the weed seed content is lower. And also there's less erosion because this farmer is able to do no-till farming. You know, the, the soil doesn't get disturbed as much. The corn stubble is still there and you have less erosion going on. Probably also have better soil. You don't, um, don't disturb the microbiota as much if you're not plowing the soil. And this sort of analysis is really what's driving the, the purchase of um, herbicide resistant um, seeds by farmers is not the, the initial cost, but the amount of labor that's involved. And so this soybean farmer can implant his soybeans, you know, spray them, and then basically go on vacation till harvest time. And that's very different from before Roundup Ready soybeans that he would have to be there all summer taking care of his soybeans. And so right now, you know, you'd have a very hard time getting far soybean farmers to drop Roundup Ready soybeans because it's really reduced their costs so much or increased their profits. So the Net effect has been is that the Roundup has been increasing over the last uh, you know, 40 or so, 40 some years since it's been initially uh, sold by Monsanto. Um, so 71 it was discovered, 1996 we had the first Roundup Ready soybeans and last couple years you know, we have um, literally hundreds of thousands of tons of Roundup sold worldwide. That's also increased because the patent on Roundup has expired, now everybody can make it the price is cheaper and probably more farmers are using it. So this has created a problem now. So in the past, you know, as farmers were growing crops, they were using different herbicides at different times. And you, know, you had a lower chance of resistance developing as you're using different herbicides on different crops as you're cycling through crops. Now you have, let's say in the Midwest, you have Roundup Ready soybeans and Roundup Ready corn and you're doing a cycle of corn and soybeans, but it's Roundup, 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 sprayed every year. And it's really hard to, to stay ahead of evolution. There's now a very, very strong selection for you know, Roundup Ready weeds over millions of acres in the Midwest. And um, since uh, 1996, there's 40 some weeds that have been discovered now that are um, Roundup resistant. So this is now, uh, creating a problem, obviously, because Roundup is less effective. Here's Palmer's amaranth and giant ragweed, two of the more important weeds in corn and soybean fields. And what this means is that our uh, Roundup-ready crops are not nearly as effective anymore as they used to be. Um, and this is now developed into a sort of an arms race. The companies, uh, Dow AgroSciences, um, Monsanto, Bayer, and others, are now developing additional crops that either have other herbicide resistance or have double herbicide resistance. So if you have a crop plant that's resistant to Roundup and Basta, if you're spraying both at the same time, the chances of a weed developing spontaneous resist resistance to both of these is much lower. Um, but it's hard to tell what the future is going to bring. So we're going to be getting progressively more herbicide resistant weeds. And this whole idea of um, 
herbicide-resistant crops, reducing the use of herbicides is probably going to not be true in the long run as we get, again, more herbicide-resistant weeds. We had this very nice window of about 20 years where we had essentially no weeds in our fields because there were no herbicide-resistant weeds, to, or at least no weeds resistant to Roundup. Um, next, the other big trait that's out there in our fields right now is uh, Bt toxin, or insect resistance. Um, this is Bacillus thuringiensis, which makes a so-called crystal toxin, which is literally a crystallized protein inside the bacteria, which inserts, uh, it binds to the insect gut membrane, uh, creates a hole in the insect gut. The bacteria then move into the, into the hemolymph of the insect and basically eat the insect from, from the inside out. This is a an, an natural bacterium. These crystal toxins are nice in that they tend to be very specific for specific you know, classes of insects or even just families of insects. And they're considered relatively benign. They have little or no known effects on other animals, mice or humans. And they're commonly used in organic agriculture because they're considered natural agrobacterium. Sorry, uh, Bacillus thuringiensis is found everywhere in nature. You see it on, on every crop plant that you would be eating. And you can also buy BT toxins if you go down to Home Depot in, in various formulations uh, to spray on your, your house plants without any sort of permit or, or regulation needed. So the big innovation now, again, initially at the Monsanto company, is here is that um, rather than spraying Bacillus thuringiensis or their crystal toxins onto the plants, they said, well, how about if we just take the gene for that protein, move it in the plant, have the protein expressed in the plant, and then get insect resistance. This is just an e example for cotton here and cotton bullworm resistance. And this, again, has pro proved to be highly effective in that we have um, plants now that are insect resistant in a very high specificity. And in a number of studies, both in the US and in other countries, it's been shown that this has reduced insecticide use on, on crop plants, um, at least on the crop plants where th we have these transgenic um, uh, where we have the transgenic crops, and by extension also there is a, a cross sort of a herd immunity effect on, on other crop plants. So this is um, illustrated by research done in, in China where uh, most of the Chinese cotton now is genetically engineered to have a bullworm resistance with BT toxins. And sort of on the positive side is there's been a clear reduction in the use of insecticides on uh, cotton in China. We have increased levels of uh, beneficial insects like ladybugs that normally would have been killed by the insecticides. And we also have sort of a knockoff effect now on other crop plants that have smaller acreage, but where like the, the bollworms that feed on cotton are actually very broad host range. And if you're killing them on, all on the cotton plant, then you also have less damage on nearby vegetable crops that normally wouldn't be, um, would also be affected by bollworms, but there's just fewer bollworms around if the cotton, which is the majority of the acreage in that area, um, is resistant to bullworms. Sort of on a negative side of this, though, is that um, previously farmers had been spraying their cotton with a, sort of a broad range insecticide, um, killing not only their target insect, the bullworm, but also other pests that would be on cotton. And these mirrored bugs, which were also a pest on cotton, um, now become more dominant uh, because they're not being killed by this broad range insecticide. And the other effect now, as they've been growing um, bullworm resistant cotton for a number of years now in China, we're getting bullworms that are resistant to this. This has been less of a problem in the US with developing resistant insects to BT toxins because um, we have fairly strong regulations of so-called refugia where they have, if you grow bullworm resistant cotton, you have to have a certain amount of acreage of cotton that doesn't have BT toxin in it. So there's always a population of sensitive bullworms that are mating with any bullworm that might develop resistance. And since resistance tends to be a recessive trait, that gets diluted out and it delays the time in which it takes for insects to develop resistance to this if there's always a population of insects that are feeding on plants that don't have BT toxins. And so that, those rules have been implemented for both corn and cotton in the US and have really delayed the onset of resistant um, insects, unlike in China and India where there was uh, regulations haven't been as strong, and especially in India, there's been multiple development of bullworm resistance uh, to BT um, cotton. Uh, um. Also, sort of looking at it from the, the farmer's point of view, there's positives and negatives to having BT resistant corn plants in this case. 
You get, you know, obviously you get control of the insect all, all year long. You don't have to spray the plants because that reduces the cost of spraying. Um, if you have resistant plants, there's not only the benefits of not having the, the insect eating your plant, you also have fewer fungal infections that might come in through the insect. You have less lodging in the corn if there's no insect damage in the corn plants. But there are also sort of you know, negative costs associated with this for the farmer. Um, you're paying for insect resistance even in years when you don't need it, for instance. If you were spraying insecticides, you could wait and see, is there going to be a problem with rootworms this year, and then spray your field. And um, it's also not a, a way to increase your yield. It's just a way to maintain the yield that you already have rather than you know, get more yield. It's just um, sort of yield maintenance rather than yield increase. It's not actually making the corn grow better. It's just protecting it. right? Um, also, as I mentioned already with the cotton, we're only protecting against the insects that we're targeting here. And in this case, a Bt corn is usually targeting corn earworms or corn rootworms, so either beetles or moths. And there's been some evidence that as we're using more and more Bt corn in the United States, we're getting increased numbers of aphids on the corn plants because aphids are not targeted by these Bt uh, toxins. Um, the other thing that's been done now to decrease resistance development is to have multiple Bt toxins with different mechanisms of action. And so um, Roundup is um, obviously in all the corn plants that are being sold, essentially all of them, but they then now are stacking multiple Bt toxins with different modes of actions targeting the same insect. So again, it's going to take longer for these insects to develop resistance. And again, this is um, smart stacks and um, one of the current products on the market, which has now two herbicide resistances, three Bt toxins against caterpillars, three Bt toxins against beetles all feeding on corn. So what's the effect of this for farmers? That's illustrated here, sort of a, a long-term um, yield data for the United States. Um, here before 1935, this is probably corn as it was since the days of the Mayas who first domesticated corn, relatively low, low yield. And what we have now is about six-fold higher yield than what we had at the, the basal level. And there are three main innovations here. One is the development of um, double cross hybrids. So you have four corn varieties that you're crossing together to make one crop for the, um, the farmer to plant. Uh, then they develop single cross hybrids. And then we have biotechnology here you know, on the order of 20 years ago now. Biotechnology now means not only um, genetic engineering, but also molecular breeding. So allowing you to select for specific natural DNA segments. So breeding for the DNA that provides resistance or whatever trait you're interested in, rather than breeding for you know, uh, the, the trait itself. And that's really accelerated things. And um, one way of looking at this, the net effect of this is, is illustrated here in this next slide. Um, on the left here in green, I've put in the, the total acreage developed to crop plants in the United States each year, shoved sort of all the way over to the left um, if we had the same yield that we had in 1935, the green area on the right would, would have to be developed to crop plant production. And so clearly, we don't have that much land in the United States. And if we were going to be feeding the people in the country right now with the yield in 1935, we probably wouldn't be able to do it. So there are some benefits to having this increased yield, basically more food from the same amount of land. So the other obvious question is, is how far can this go? You know, we have so far a six-fold increase in corn yield. How much higher can we bring up corn yield than we have right now? How much, what's the upper limit of yield per acre for corn? And you know, basically, how long can this continue? And one way to address this question is that corn, like anything else we do in the United States, is a competitive process. And there's also competitive corn growing. And so this is the, the three winners of the National Corn Yield Contest. It's um, David Hula is the winner. His son, Craig Hula, got second place. And his brother, Johnny Hula, got third place last year in terms of corn yield. So it's um, the top corn farmers in the country having about you know, 36,000 kilograms per hectare, whereas the average farmer had about 12,000 kilograms per hectare. So that shows that the upper you know, potential yield on corn probably is still at least threefold higher than what we have now. And there's room for improvement for making corn that you know, is highly adapted and you know, highly yield 
um, increase per acre under, under optimal corn growing conditions. Um, finally, I want to talk about one more trait which has really been quite successful in canola is hybridization is a trait that's been bred in canola. This is a, tr a tricky one. So they have um, wanting to make hybrid seeds. I show you the, showed you the effect of hybrid corn really increasing yield. They wanted to do with this with canola, but canola is a more complicated crop because corn has the male and the female flowers separate. You can detassel corn and make hybrid to corn very easily. For canola, they had to make male sterile plants with this pollen-specific enzyme they called barnase, for bacillus RNase. And what they did is they make a plant that carries barnase and basta resistance linked to each other directly adjacent. They cross this to a wild type plant. And from the progeny of this plant, three quarters carry the barnase gene and are also basta resistant and therefore make no, no pollen. And then you put this uh, plant, spray it with basta, you have only male sterile plants. So then you put your plant that you want to pollinate in the same field has bar star, which inhibits the barnase enzyme. And then you need, you can pollinate these, you get hybrid canola because bar star inhibits, and you sell the hybrid seeds then to the farmers. There's an additional complication now that canola, unlike corn, is not wind pollinated. So there's now a whole industry of people selling bees to companies that make hybrid canola seeds. So this is obviously a lot of work. To make hybrid seeds, you sell them for more money, and the farmers nevertheless are willing to pay a lot of money for hybrid canola seeds um, that are being produced. And the German company Bayer uh, developed these uh, hybrid canola seeds. They have a 15% higher yield, so farmers are willing to pay more if you get 15% more yield for the same amount of effort. And Bayer, which had never previously been in the canola business in a period of you know, 15 years or so, went from 0% to two-thirds of the canola market in North America, simply because they had this product of hybrid canola that they were able to sell to the farmers. Um, one other transgenic crop, somebody mentioned papayas in Hawaii already. Um, papayas are a little bit sort of different situation. Uh, papayas in Hawaii were being devastated by papaya ring spot virus, which kills the papaya trees. On the left, you see sensitive plants. On the right, you see virus-resistant papayas, which Interestingly, were not developed by a company, but were developed by the University of Hawaii. And what they did is they made um, papaya that are resistant to the virus with an, a process that's called RNA interference. So the um, ring spot virus is an RNA virus. The RNA gets translated into protein and then causes this ring spot disease on the papaya. The GMO papayas now have this antisense RNA, which then is a signal to the plant to activate an enzyme called Dicer, which degrades double-stranded RNA. And then we have no disease. We have healthy papayas. So this is very effective. And the majority of the papayas in Hawaii are now genetically engineered. And we have enough genetically engineered papayas now that it's brought the ring spot disease to a low enough level that people who want to grow non-genetically engineered papayas are able to grow them. Whereas previously, where everything was non-genetically engineered, it was impossible to grow papayas. They were, the industry was sort of shifting over time to new islands, and then the ring spot virus would catch up. And now they have a sort of a stable situation. They have virus-resistant papaya, but also then the ability to grow uh, virus-sensitive papaya because of the majority of the papaya being virus-resistant. Resi this same technology now has been used for a number of other virus diseases, and a lot of things um, that are being developed for virus resistance are in the same um, same, um, me same mechanism, basically just make an antisense virus, express it in the plant, and then let, let the plant use its own enzymes to degrade the virus. Things that are being commercialized um, are illustrated here. Um, we have um, squ summer squash from Monsanto, plum pox virus from the USDA, potato virus X from the Monsanto, and bean golden mosaic virus from Embrapa, which is basically the, the equivalent of the, the USDA in Brazil. So I showed you this list here of things that have been approved for, for planting in various countries. So things that are deregulated, which we say are safe for human consumption, but most of these are actually not planted at all anymore for various reasons. I'm just going to give a few examples now, things that have been approved for planting but are not commercialized anymore. 
So some examples here are the flavor saver tomato, which really wasn't as good on the shelf as it might be, so people weren't willing to spend more money on it. Uh, virus resistant potatoes worked really, really well, so farmers would have used them, but McDonald's and Frito-Lay both said that they weren't going to use any GMO potatoes, and since that's the major potato market in the US, you know, farmers just aren't going to plant it. Um, flax, there just really wasn't any need for it. Uh, wheat was genetically engineered for various pathogen resistance, but most of our wheat gets exported to Europe, and Europe will not take any genetically engineered wheat for human consumption. And so farmers in the US are not going to plant any genetically engineered wheat. Another case here is, is golden rice, which was developed for um, uh, developing countries to combat um, uh, blindness caused by vitamin A deficiency. If you only eat white rice, you're going to have a vitamin A deficiency, and literally tens or hundreds of thousands of people around the world are going blind because of vitamin A deficiency. But this was, as illustrated here uh, by, by Greenpeace, it was force feeding um, GMO crops to their uh, victims, um, was basically um, removed from the market due to the large number of protests. There are, however, ongoing pro um, programs now to make high carotenoid crop plants, not through genetic engineering, but through classic breeding, both in corn and cassava and plantains. You can have high carotenoid through breeding, and those are being developed and probably will be you know, um, implemented in the near future for developing countries, where lack of vitamin A is a more serious problem than it is around here. So what else would be genetically engineered? I think you know, a lot of things right now are all being targeted for toward farmers. Golden rice would be an exception. But I think a lot of sort of consumer targets are going to come up in the, the near future. Uh, one thing would be a seed oil content. So a lot of crop plants are, are bred for oil. And there's lots of different ways you can develop vegetable oil for different product uses. You can you know, use it for more engineering type things. You can use it for feed, um, for animals. You can have you know, omega-3 fatty acids, so make canola oil or soybean oil more like fish oil, so to make it beneficial. And so there may be some um, points here for engineering crop plants to make um, oil content for specific purposes and also for specific human purposes. And similarly, you know, better nutritional content could be achieved in, by genetic engineering um, and maybe, you know, unlike the golden rice, move into acceptance for consumer purposes rather than farmer purposes. There's also a lot of potential now for um, cosmetic sort of things. There, the blue rose was in the uh, news a few years ago. Um, again, something that's more of a novelty, a genetically engineered blue rose, because it really wasn't all that blue. You know, it's sort of m light mauve, pale blue. And compared to you know, just dyeing the rose blue, it's a lot more expensive to make a genetically engineered rose than the, a rose that just has been dyed blue. So um, what are some of the concerns about genetically engineered plants? I've already hinted at some of them. One is that you know, we, if we make a genetically engineered herbicide-resistant plant, it will cross with other plants and bring the herbicide resistance then into the, the weeds. Uh, we're fortunate here in the US that many of our important crop plants have no near relatives that are, are weeds. So there's no relatives of corn, soybeans, cotton, potato here in the United States. So if we genetically engineer those plants, we're not going to get our genes moving into weeds. However, some of the plants that we have genetically engineered and are out in the field um, do have wild relatives. And there's already been evidence of genetic drift from canola into wild crucifers growing in Canada, for instance. So that is a concern and something that um, we should be much more worried about because it's, once it's out in the weeds, we really can't control it at all anymore. Rice is a particular example here. So right now, we're not growing any genetically engineered rice in the United States because the number one weed in rice fields is actually rice. And so um, there's a basically a, a feral or wild relative of rice called Louisiana red rice, which grows in the rice fields. It looks essentially like rice, but it has a red color, has harder gloom. It shatters, so it drops off before the farmer can harvest it. And so it's the number one weed in the field, and you can't get rid of it because it essentially is rice. And if we made Roundup Ready rice, you know, in the next year we would have ri Roundup Ready uh, red rice. And so for that reason, right now there's no genetically engineered rice in the, um, in the United States, even though farmers, you know, in theory, would want it, um, it's, not, it's not out there. The other sort of concern is genetically engineered crops versus non-genetically engineered crops. 
if I have my genetically engineered cabbage, is it going to pollinate your non-genetically engineered cabbage? And then the next year you'll have on your organic farm genetically engineered cabbage, even though you don't want to. Um, that certainly is a concern. However, you know, genetic drift does happen, but it's probably not nearly as much as we think is going on. So corn, for instance, is a, a wind-pollinated crop plant. In theory, you know, every cornfield could be pollinating every other cornfield. But when we you know, look what we have in corn, you know, we have different varieties of corn. We have sweet corn, we have popcorn, we have field corn, we have decorative corn. And we've been maintaining this for a long time. And we don't have worries about our field corn contaminating our popcorn field or our sweet corn get contaminated with pollen from field corn as we're saving seeds for the next year. So it is possible to, on a, a larger scale to maintain crop plant integrity, but it's never going to be 100%. There's always going to be some genetic drift from your genetically engineered crops to um, things that you might want to not have genetically engineered. And that sort of drift probably doesn't matter so much if you're dealing with Roundup Ready. But there, if you look at the list of things that are genetically engineered that have been planted for, you know, just for research purposes, there's all sorts of things that you might not want to have in your food supply at all. So, I mean, I guess, you know, sperm disabling antibodies, for instance, you wouldn't want to have in your food supply. Um, and if you look at what's out there, you know, if you have thousands of these field trials going on every year, if you tell me that every single one of these researchers removes every single crop plant from his field at the end of the year, I'm just not going to believe you. So there, things are going to happen when you have thousands of field trials going on. And it's sort of a wild west out there in terms of how easy it is to just do experiments with genetically engineered plants. And there is going to be things happening. And if you look at what could be moving into our food supply, there might be some things that you'd be concerned about. Um, one good example of what has happened, there was a company called Prodigene, which was making a, a pig vaccine in corn. So the, the idea was you make the vaccine in the corn plant, you feed the corn to the pigs, and the pigs are then resistant to various diseases. Um, they didn't clean up their cornfield very well at the end of the year. Um, some of this corn grew up the next year. This is volunteer corn coming up in a, a soybean field or, or just among the weeds. This then pollinated other corn around in other fields. And so we had pig vaccines sort of starting to enter the, the food supply. And they spent $3 million just cleaning up you know, after their field trial in the previous year. And if you do a, a web search for Prodigene, you can come up with something like this. The, the Prodigene.com webpage is no longer available. So they went out of business because they had this huge expense because they didn't clear up their field at the end of the year. And this was noticed. I'm sure there are field trials where it wasn't cleaned up that, that weren't noticed. The other concern is, is safety. You know, things, even things that seem safe might not be safe. You know, all of us eat corn. All of us eat potatoes. But there are certainly things in corn that we would call uh, concerning or in potatoes. Uh, for instance, patatin is a protein in every single potato that you've ever eaten. Um, patatin is really good against insects. You would think, you know, everybody eats potatoes, let's take this patatin protein and move it into corn or soybeans and make the corn or soybeans insect resistant. However, um, there are a certain number of people in the U.S. that are allergic to patatin. And so if we suddenly had patatin in all the food, then we have these people with food allergies that suddenly can't eat corn or soybeans anymore, and that would be a huge problem. Uh, a small molecule in corn called dimboa, which my lab actually works on, is very good as insect deterrent, but again, the idea of actually increasing this molecule to make insect resistance is probably not a good idea because it's also a carcinogen. So you don't want to have it in the seeds that you're, you're eating. Another possible concern is sort of the, the inexact science of a lot of genetic engineering right now. It's sort of, you know, transform and pray. You blast the genes at your plant, they insert somewhere. They're having some sort of variable expression. You don't know where they're inserted in the genome. You screen through thousands of plants to have one that has just the right phenotype that you're wanting to work with. So, and there could be maybe some, some secondary effects that you don't know about simply because you, you, the way you did this transformation. That, however, is likely to, to change in the sort of the near future. You've probably heard of uh, CRISPR-Cas9 in the news. Um, so what's going on here, this is a actual a bacteri a bacterial antivirus defense is the CRISPR-Cas9 system. So there are bacteria that have this enzyme called Cas9. It's illustrated here in beige. 
and then the gRNA or guide RNA, which is encoded in the bacterial genome, which then has sequence similarity to viruses that have previously infected these bacteria. This guide RNA now allows the Cas9 um, enzyme to cut the bacteria, to cut the viral DNA and thereby provide resistance to the bacteria against viruses that are infecting the bacteria. And so similar to the agrobacterium story that I told you about is that this can be hijacked for genetic engineering and that instead of having a sequence of virus RNA, we can put any other sequence of RNA in there and specifically cut any part of the genome, whether it's plants or animals or even humans, and do very targeted, precise gene editing. And that's illustrated here. This is some experiments that I was associated with in my lab. Um, using a guide RNA to make targeted mutagenesis in corn, so targeting a specific gene, and here at the bottom we've sequenced, and what happens after the DNA is cut, we get imprecise repair by the corn plant, and we get small mutations or single base pair changes here in the corn plant, and we can knock out genes in corn in a, a targeted manner. And so if I took away the guide RNA from this corn plant and put it in the field, and it had this mutation, there's no way that you could tell whether this mutation was made by genetic engineering because every corn plant in the field out there has lots of mutations. You know, they're hit by cosmic rays, there's mistakes in gene replication. And so this is sort of a, a gray area in genetic engineering right now is that I can make a mutation and you can't tell me how I made the mutation. And the USDA at this point has decided that if you make a mutation in a plant by CRISPR-Cas9 and you take away the enzyme in the guide RNA, it's no longer considered genetic engineering. If it's a small mutation like this that could have occurred by random chance, and if the plant is out in the field and there was no way to tell how that mutation occurred, they, de they decided it's not genetic engineering because they're going to regulate the end product. They're not going to regulate how you got there to the end product, right? It's a little bit different in Europe where they regulate the method how you get there we're regulating the, the end product. And so this is going to open up all sorts of opportunities for genetic engineering because you don't have to go a lot through a lot of these USDA regulatory hurdles because it's not considered genetic engineering. And so you can knock out, let's say, a gene that causes browning in apples with a method like this and not really be engineering the plant. Um, there's still some hurdles with the EPA and the FDA who haven't gotten to this consensus yet. Um, the next step here with this targeted mutagenesis will be gene replacement. So you cut the DNA and the plant by homologous recombination puts in whatever template you want to, but that's not uh, fully functional yet. So sort of in, in summary then, I think you know, what we have out there as genetically engineered crops in the US right now is, is pretty safe. It's gone through a fairly lengthy regulatory process. I think it's, it's good that we have this regulatory process because you know, things that are ending, entering the food supply should be regulated. And um, overall, you know, there's a lot of potential for genetic engineering, but we need to be careful. And as I pointed out, there's also a lot of concerns. Um, probably, you know, at least in the US here, where we have a general acceptance, you know, genetically engineered crops will be, continue to be accepted, but you know, sort of niche markets will be there for people who don't want genetic engineering, there's certainly going to be a subset of people like uh, uh, Greenpeace or Prince Charles who say, you know, th they're never going to eat any genetically engineered food and they're quite welcome to do that. Um, Prince Charles has referred to genetic engineering as, as tinkering with, with God's plan. Um, as future head of the Cur Church of England, he might be one of the few people who actually know what God's plan is. And so, um, We'll see what happens in, in terms of regulatory ap approval in Britain and, and Europe in the longer term.